look at her like you never been before. The life you knew like a thousand pieces on the floor. Where's for sure times like this when most people drive you to your knees? Are you ever gonna get back to the you you used to be? Tell your heart to beat again. Close your eyes and breathe it in. Let the shadows form away. Step into the light of grace. Yesterday was closing doors. You don't need them anymore. Say goodbye to where you've been. And tell your heart to beat again. And tell your heart to beat again. Let every heart break and every scar be a picture that reminds you who has carried you this far. Tell your heart to beat again. Close your eyes and breathe it in. Let the shadows form away. Step into the light of grace. Yesterday was closing doors. You don't need them anymore. Say goodbye to where you've been. And tell your heart to beat again. And tell your heart to beat again. And beat again. Yeah, all right. In the holy of holies, behind a heavy veil, set the ark of the covenant where the most high dwell. And only the high priest could enter therein to offer a sacrifice. For atonement of sin But the veil was rent in an instant Revealing that holy place Cause on a hill nearby On a rugged cross Justice met grace Now I can go Into the holy of holies, I can kneel and make my petitions known. I can go into the holy of holies, and although I'm just a common man, because of God's redemption plan. I can boldly approach the throne. Now the blood of sacrifices is no more required. For the blood of Christ, the spotless lamb, completely paid the price. In the sacrifice of worship, we'll open heaven's door, allowing us to enter in the presence of the Lord. Now I can go into the holy of holies. I can Make my petitions known I can go Into the holy of holies And although I'm just a common man Because of God's redemption plan I can boldly approach the throne because of you, Lord, we thank you. We can go straight to you. You are awesome. I can go into the holy of holies. I 
can kneel and make my petitions known. I can go into the holy of holies, and although I'm just a common man, because of God's redemption plan, I can boldly approach the beyond it I can't even explain it it's amazing it's good to be here you guys happy yeah. amen. amen you know why you're happy yeah. amen yeah. amen, yeah. amen. Uh, I'm gonna introduce myself and then we're gonna pray and then we're gonna jump into this message it's an amazing message that I believe God's put on my heart for a while now even far beyond my dad told me that the pastor was looking for us to come and speak, and it was on my heart far beyond that, and it was, so I'm excited to see what God's going to do today, right? Amen, amen. I just want to say again, I know my dad already said it, but happy anniversary to you guys. You guys are amazing. Uh, 23 years, that's amazing. Amen. Seriously, I couldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. They, they changed my life in so many different ways, and I know I'm so thankful for them, but I just want to say Congratulations, guys. I love you. Amen. All right. So I want you guys to open up with me to, let's go to Romans 8, 19. That's my all-time favorite scripture. Romans 8, 19. Yes, sir, it is. Awesome. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't need it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Is this water for me? Awesome. Wonderful. So today it's going to be a simple, it's going to be a simple message, but I think it's going to be a powerful one because it's all about Jesus, right? Amen. You guys know the gospel, right? Amen. It means good news. The gospel means good news. So today I'm going to be preaching good news, not some dreary stuff that we sometimes hear, but good news. It's called the cross. That thing right there 2,000 years ago spoke something so loud that it's echoing into time today and it's changing my life. Um, so did you guys get to Romans 8.19? I'm going to read this, but I want to introduce myself a little bit. I'm, I'm Chris. My name's Chris, as my dad introduced me. Um, I'm 20 years old. I was born in Lyon, France, um, not far from Paris. Well, a little far, but in France nonetheless. Uh, I speak French, and I have a brother named Jeremy. He's going to school with me, too. And um, so I just graduated my second year at Karis Bible College. I'm a graduate. I have my minister's license, and I have an associate's in biblical studies, but I hope my credentials don't throw you away because this is a word from God. And um, I just want to thank you guys again for this opportunity. It means a lot to me. But my name's Chris, and I'm hoping to get to know you guys even better after the service a little bit. And pardon me, I move a lot because I'm happy. I'm happy to be up here. It's good. It's good. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to pray. So it says in Romans 8, 19. You guys there? Amen. All right, so it says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You guys have K yep, KJV, I'm using KJV too. But the earnest expectation of the manifestations of the sons of God. Today I'm going to talk about three things. It's simple, I'm going to break it down. It's three things. It's going to be talking about relationship. The most important thing that you'll ever experience with the walk of God is a relationship with God. Second thing is identity. We got to know our identities and believers. And the third thing is transformation. The gospel goes far beyond just hearing. It changes, right? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for this opportunity once again, Lord, that you're here in this place. God, I feel it. I feel your presence in this place. I thank you so much, Father, for the heart of Pastor Bob to allow me to come up here so gracefully, Lord. I just thank you so much for him. I pray today, Lord God, that it wouldn't be my words that hits the hearts, but it would be your words, Lord. I pray that your words would spark transformation and end of it in everyone's lives today, Lord. That wherever their walk may be with you, that it would grow. And I just thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, to have your way in this place. And I just thank you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So the cross. I talked about that a little bit. You guys know the cross. It, a lot of times, I think believers get this image of the cross as, as something that's a pointing a finger at you. It's saying, you did something wrong. This is not, this is your fault. This is why I came over here on this earth to die. But that's absolutely not the truth. The cross says, I love you so much. It says, I love you even though you don't know who you are yet. I love you. 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus came and died. Ha <laughs> ha. He didn't die because you messed up. He died because he loves you. He dies because he saw something greater in you than sometimes we see in ourselves. John 3.16, everybody knows it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. You can take gave and you can translate that with paid. God so loved the world that he paid. His only son, he cashed it in. Nobody goes to a dealership buys a car, and says, oh, it's worth $5,000. Here, I'll give you six, right? Nobody goes and buys a, a banana at the store and says, oh, it's worth 50 cents. I'll give you 20, or 20, I'll give you 75, sorry. Nobody's willing to pay something more than for what it's worth, right? I know you guys are bargain hunters out there, right? You guys like those coupons, two for one? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> See, God didn't die because you weren't, you weren't worth his life. He died because you were worth his life. He died because he saw something great in you. And, he, and today I'm going to talk about his life a little bit, and I'm going to talk about where he left off so that we can continue the journey, right? Amen? Amen. So let's look at this scripture one more time. It says Romans 8, 19. Thank you, Frank, for being so quick. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature... Waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Who's the sons of God? All my theologians out there. That's us, right? Amen. We're in the process of being transformed into the son of God, and that's a bold statement, but it's a true one. Read your Gospels. I promise it's there. Amen. So the, the earnest expectation, that's the, all the world. You know, in another translation, I think in the New King James, it says that all of the world, or one of the translations says, all the world is expecting, is yearning for the manifestations of the sons of God. What does it mean to yearn? What does it mean to, to, to eagerly wait for something? It looks like an addict, and I know it's a bold statement, but it looks like an addict that's craving a fix. You know, it says um, somewhere in Romans, it says that we're, that they're, earnestly, I looked it up, I looked in Hebrew, and it, and it means to eagerly wait for something, to shake for something so badly you want it. The manifestation of us. That's what they're looking for. The world out there is the world out there is waiting for each and every single one of you. And I know you guys don't always feel it, and I know that there's times in life when we don't always feel joy. And I know we could have been in the parking lot earlier and we could have maybe had an argument with our spouse or we could, have, we could have been thinking something bad about ourselves and we came in here and we had to feel happy. And we don't always feel happy, right? You remember Paul and Silas when they went to prison? They were praising the Lord, right? They were praising the Lord. They were happy. They were happy. Even though they had been beaten wrongfully because they weren't doing anything wrong. They were beaten and then thrown into prison. Thrown into prison. Locked up. But they were happy. They were dancing. And the chains fell loose, didn't they, right? In the scriptures it says that we have to have a single eye. It says the eye of the, of the body is the lamp. I forget. Let me see my scriptures. It says the eye is a lamp to our body. So if our eye is single... Let me see, that is Matthew 6.22. It says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if our eye is single, then we're headed in the right direction, right? Our eyes have to be set on Jesus. And a lot of times that looks like a, like a, like a physical representation, or you can say your eyes are a physical thing, but here it's talking about a mental eye. Where's your focus? Where's your, your, your pursuit of God, you know? What are you setting your eyes on? You know, I... I a little bit more about myself. I uh, do children's ministry. I love working with kids. It's a passion of mine. I uh, work every Sunday with the I have such a heart. I loved what the little girls here did today. This was amazing, no? 
It was awesome. You know, it says in the kingdom, it says in the Bible that no one can enter the kingdom unless you become like a child. Our hearts have to be rightfully placed to enter into the kingdom. So um, I teach little kids, and, and we do this little representation. I try and teach them a little bit about this. Um, it's kind of funny because sometimes I try and feed a baby the whole steak at one time, but I learn to break it down into little bites so they can eat it. <laughs> and um, so what I want you guys to do, and if you guys feel free to do this, follow along with me, but if you hold out one finger and you close one eye, and you look at that finger, you see how it's in focus? But if you look in the background, you'll see that the finger becomes blurry. It's an easy, easy thing to see right now. But when you're feeling hardship, like Paul and Silas, and you're getting beaten and thrown into prison, your focus isn't on Jesus. It's on your bruises. It's on your bleeding. It's on your situation, your circumstance, where you're at. But God says, get your eyes single. Focus on me, and that's where you'll go. A lot of times we see feelings, and this is another subject. I just wanted to share a little bit about identity. That's, that's where we're going to head here, but um, I just want to share with you guys. Um, where do I want to go? Yeah, so we're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about Jesus a little bit because if we don't know Jesus, then we don't know who we really are, and I think that's going to, to lead into the second thing. Who are you? Because it says the sons of God, the manifestations of the sons of God. I know you theologians said that you guys know that's us, right? But the sons of God, who is God? Because if we don't know God, then we don't know who we are, right? What did Jesus do 2,000 years ago? It says it right there. By his stripes, we were healed. By his stripes, we were healed. Jesus was beaten and whipped so that we could become healed. What else happened that day? He was, he, was, he was rebuked by his friends. His friends left him. But you know who never turned his back on him? Was his father. Right? So Jesus was, was whipped so that we could become healed. Jesus lost his identity that day. It says that he was marred bef- beyond any man. He lost his physical identity because nobody could even know who he was. He took on sin. He took on shame. He took on pain. He took on rebuke. And even his best friends, Peter, denied him three times in the same day. He denied him, right? Man, Jesus kept his focus. His eye was single, and it was the cross. And he said, I don't hate you. I love you, right? So Jesus was beaten. He was whipped so that we could become healed. He was denied, or he was, um, how to say, he was pushed away by his friends, and yet he still had his eyes single on the Lord. But you know, one day I was talking with the Lord, and I was praying, and, and he told me that it wasn't the whips, and it wasn't the way my friends left me that hurt me the most. You know what the hardest thing about losing his life was? It was losing his, um, his relationship with his father that day. He said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do, right? Do you think they knew what they were doing? No. I think, I think in the natural, they knew what they were doing. They, they, they crucified a man that they hated so much. And they, remember, they've been planning this for a long, long time. They had been ever since his ministry. What was the first thing that happened? When he preached, the first time he preached, what was the first thing that happened? They said, let's kill him, right? They've been planning that for a while. They knew it, and they've been wanting to get him. He said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the physical, they knew what they were doing, but in the spiritual, they did not, because Jesus saw something greater in them than they saw in themselves. He saw what could happen if they laid themselves down and let God live in them. We sang a song today. It was so beautiful. It says, I give myself away, have your way in me. I give myself away. Man, that's an honor and a privilege to say, Jesus, you take my life because where I've been and where I'm at right now is not the greatest. I mean, for me, I I talk about identity, and just to lighten up the mood a little bit, (laughs) um, I talk about identity, and I went to Sri Lanka not long ago. I know my, my dad mentioned that maybe to you guys. I went to Sri Lanka on my mission trip, and then a week before that, I, went, I was in Mexico, and I was on another mission trip, and I had to share this message about identity. And it's funny because God gave me a representation of what identity looks like in our lives. 
Um, sometimes we get misunderstood about what it, what it really means to have an identity in Christ. Because we see ourselves as an animal or a dog in the sight of God. We see ourselves as so lowly and so unacceptable in the sight of God. But that's not the truth, right? Because Jesus paid the price for something greater than just a dog. So I gave the example of, I was in Mexico, and we see all these little, um, we see all these little dogs uh, these street dogs running all over, all over the place, abandoned dogs just running all over the place. And we saw the same thing in Sri Lanka. And I told the people, I said, we're not, we're not street dogs in the sight of God. We're not. We're just not. In Hebrews, and I'm going to go a little off story. In Hebrews, it says that who are we that God will be mindful of us? He says that he placed us a little lower than the angels. <laughs> Funny enough, the angels in Hebrew doesn't mean Angels, it means Elohim, which means God. God placed us a little lower than himself. We're not street dogs. And it's funny, I, I gave that representation to another lady. I clean windows for a living, and um, I like to brighten up people's day. And um, yeah, <laughs> so it's good. I was, I was cleaning windows, and there's this lady. She said, she was asking me about what it is I see in myself at the age of 20 that I want to preach the gospel. And I told her about the story about how we sometimes see ourselves as street dogs in the sight of God, but God sees us as far better than that. And she said, I was, even if I saw myself as a dog, that would be pretty great. She told me about her little poodle that she has that she takes care of. This dog gets fed um, fresh chicken every day, gets groomed every day, has its own bed in its own room. <laughs> So the story didn't quite work in America as it did in uh, <laughs> Sri Lanka or Mexico. <laughs> yeah. But nonetheless, we're not, we're not, we're nothing. You, when, we're not nothing. We're not nothing. A lot of times people think humility is pushing themselves so low to the ground that they are like, lowly am I, right? Lowly am I. That's not the truth. You know what true humility is? True humility is agreeing with what God says and what his word says about you. That's true humility. When you wake up in the morning, amen. When we wake up in the morning, instead of looking yourself in the mirror and saying, man, I screwed up yesterday. I messed up, right? We should look in the mirror and say, wow, what a wonderful thing God's doing in my life that I'm transforming into his son's image. Because that's what we're doing. We're in the process of being transformed into his son's image. That's what the word of God's doing in our lives. Amen. I'm 20 years old, like I told you before. I was, um, I was born again when I was nine years old. And when I was at the age of 15, 14, I think it was 14, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Something radical changed in my heart that day. Something big. The Spirit of God hit me tangibly. I started speaking in other tongues, and something big happened. I can't explain it, but something, I mean, amazing. Spiritual. Something bigger than myself happened that day. At the age of 16, I had an encounter with God. I um, saw myself. I was having a dream that day, and I saw myself arriving to heaven. And this was after my life, when I had completed my life. Maybe I was 120 at the time or whatever. But I, um, <laughs> I, I saw myself arriving to heaven, and I thought, God, you know, I did an amazing job in my career. I excelled in my career. I made over, you know, I made over six, um, six figures. I had a family. I had kids. Everything was great. But then I got to heaven, and I realized none of that was really worth anything. Because what can I bring to the king? If I couldn't tell myself that day when I arrived to heaven and God so welcomed me in and said, good job, Chris, you are my faithful servant in whom I am well pleased. If I couldn't go and look at Jesus and say, this is the life that I worked so hard for, here it is, thank you, Lord, for living in me, then it wasn't worth anything. So I was 16 and I made a decision that day. I said, Lord God, I don't understand everything. I'm ignorant in a lot of things, and I'm still growing, praise God. But God, I don't understand everything, but my life is completely yours. At the age of 16, I made a decision to serve him with my whole heart because I knew something. If I wasn't going to give him my every single day, then it wasn't worth it to me. 
It wasn't worth it to me. So I made a decision at the age of 16. God led me to go to Bible college at the age of 18 when I graduated. Um, I still didn't have everything figured out, and I still don't, praise God. But, you know, I'm moving in the right direction. And, and I got graduated from high school, went to straight to Bible college, and I started on this journey towards the Lord and getting to know him. And um, it was amazing. I studied the life of Jesus. I studied how he started ministry when he was 30 years old. And I'm 20. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm only 20, you know. And he gave me the example of David in the Bible. The little David. He beat Goliath, didn't he? You guys know this story? He conquered a giant when he was in his teens, right? And I said, God, I don't, I don't understand. I wish I was a little older. And then he gave me the story of David. And he said, look at my servant David. He is a, he is a man after my own heart. He conquered a giant at the age of teens. And then he said, look at Moses. My servant Moses, you guys know the story of Moses, he was 80 years old when he led the Israelites out of captivity. 80 years old. There is hope, brothers and sisters. Amen? <laughs> Amen. So it says, the, it says the gifts and callings on your life are without repentance. That's what it says. The gifts and the callings on each and every single one of your lives are without repentance. I'm standing here today as a 20-year-old, and you might be in the congregation twice my age, but the gifts and the callings are without repentance. And see, what did we just read? What was the first scripture we read? Matthew 18, or 8, 19, it says, For the earnest expectations of the sons of man, the, all of the world is waiting for you. They're yearning, they're craving, like an addict needs a fix. They're waiting for you to take your place and to step into what God's calling you to do. I'm 20 years old, but I am blessed to be where I am. Thank you for this. Thank you for Pastor Bob. Amen? Amen. I, he's, training, he's training you guys to see your true identity. Every day, every Sunday, I, I've only been here twice, but I can imagine every Sunday he talks about the cross. And he's not looking at the cross saying, you screwed up, you messed up, look at you. This is what my son had to do so that you could be better. He's saying, I love you, here I am. Here I am, you were worth it. That's what Pastor Bob tells you, because he wants you to see identity, right? It's funny, God gave me this illustration of Jesus, and um, it's funny because Jesus walked on the water naturally, right? It was just who he was because he knew his identity. It was an easy thing for him, right? A lot of times we want to take a step out of the boat saying, if I walk on this water, then I must be a son of God. But God said, you got to know who you are so you can walk on the water, right? We can't, you know, a lot of times we see Christians that are praying for the sick. Praise God, they're doing the best they can do. And they're not, they're not understanding. They're getting frustrated with things because they're not seeing, seeing a manifestation in, in, in the physical. But you've got to change your heart. You've got to know who you are and your identity so that you can see the physical. It says in, in, in the scriptures, it said, we set our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. We've got to set, keep our eyes single. We've got to keep our eye on the cross. We've got to understand who we are. We've got to be transformed from the inside out. So that we can see what is not, so we can, if we can see what is unseen, then we can see what is seen. If you guys want to walk on water, which I really do, I haven't done it honestly, but I really do want to walk on water, and I believe it's possible. Amen. I am in the process, I will, amen. <laughs> we are in the process of being transformed into the image of Christ. Amen. Amen. How blessed we are, brothers and sisters, to, to, have, to have an example because all Jesus ever did was give us an example of the way we were supposed to live. Everything he did. And I'm talking from the beginning to the end. He gave us an example. Remember when Jesus came out of the water? What did, Jesus, what did the Father say? What was the first thing the Father said about Jesus? He was well pleased, amen. And you know the thing is, Jesus didn't perform one single miracle before then. He didn't step into any sort of ministry, but he knew his father was pleased with him. Amen? So it shows you one of two things. One, you don't have to do a single thing, and God still loves you so much, and he is well pleased with you. Amen? And number two, Jesus had to know his identity so he could perform ministry, right? At the age of 30, he knew his identity. He knew that the Father loved him, right? 
And he loves all of you the same way. The same way. See, Jesus gave, it says, in the, it says in the scriptures that Jesus put away his glory. Jesus came on earth as a man. Took on the Holy Spirit after he was baptized. The dove came upon him. He took on the Holy Spirit. And then he started to operate in ministry. And then he started to operate in ministry. So it shows you that Jesus just was an example. Everything Jesus did was an example. So you guys have the Spirit of God inside of you. And that's a bold statement, but it's a true statement. And we got to start realizing that the Spirit of God is alive in us. And it's active in us. And he's yearning to move within us because the all of creation is yearning to see the manifestation of Christ in you. Amen. 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 Jesus, Jesus bore our stripes so that we could become healed. He was marred beyond description so that we could gain our identity back in Christ. It says he lost his identity. Remember in the Genesis, we'll go back to Genesis, all the way at the beginning. What was the first thing that God did when he created, the, when he created people? He created Adam and Eve, right? In his image. In his image. That was what God intended since the beginning. He intended to, to have communion with you, to fellowship with you. And it wasn't the things that you were going to do for him that made him pleased with you. It was the things, or it was the relationship with God that made him pleased with you. It was who you were that made him pleased with you. I, have no, I don't have a son or a daughter yet, which I hope I do one day. But... <laughs> don't hold your breath. <laughs> And um, I don't have a son or a daughter, but I know the parents out there can agree to this, that even if your kid messes up, he crashes a car, whatever that may look like, you're not displeased with him. The things that they do might, might frustrate you, but your love for them will never ever fade. Not even for a second. Because that's the way the Father sees us. And much more so. Because our identity is secured in him. Right? One day, I was uh, frustrated with things that were going on around me. I was frustrated with situations, with finances, with the, the burdens of life of a 20-year-old. Think about it. <laughs> and um, I was frustrated with people. And God told me this. He, he gave me a powerful truth. He said, no one can offend you unless they give you your identity. Sink in a little bit. Let that sink in a little bit. No one can offend you unless they give you your identity. We walk around and we see people offending other people, getting hurt, because they're looking for something inside of, inside of other people. They're looking for an acceptance. They're looking for a love from other people that was never intended to be. They're looking for somebody to tell them that they're valuable. They're looking for somebody to tell them that they're cool or they're... They've, and I... I love when people say, good job, Chris, you preached well. But, you know, I, I, I preach for an audience of one, Jesus. <laughs> and if he can tell me you did good, Chris, and I'm proud and I'm happy. But people are walking around. They're looking for acceptance out of other people. They're trying to find something that makes them feel better because they're looking for identity, right? And I was frustrated, and I didn't, I didn't understand what the situation was, and I didn't understand why this person would do the things that they did to me. And, and I was offended. I was offended. I was hurt. You know, but God told me, you can't truly take offense from them unless they give you your identity and made me had to question myself. I said, wow, that's true. You know, I'm looking for something greater in them that they can't fill, that only God can fill. Amen. Amen. So the Holy Spirit corrected me, and then I changed my vision, and I was able to love them. In Hebrews, it says, God loved us so that we can love him, right? In the Hebrew, it doesn't even have the word him in it. It says we can, we, we've been first loved so that we can love, right? A, we'll have the ability to love him, praise God, but we'll also have the ability to love others unconditionally, not based on what they say to us, not based on what they do to us, not based on what they give to us, but unconditionally, we'll love them because we first received that love of the Father. Amen. That's what we were created for in the beginning. In Genesis, we are created for his fellowship, for, his, for communion with the Father. That's what we're always looking for. 
I, um, I was in Sri Lanka not long ago, and I was, I was preaching at this Bible college, and I shared that example of the, of the dog and whatnot, but I also shared another example that everyone is looking for their way to God. Everyone is looking for something bigger than themselves. They may not realize it's Jesus, but it is. They're looking for Jesus. So I gave this example. I said, you know, they have Buddhist temples. They have Hindu temples. They have, they have you name it, they got it. Because they're working their way to God, but I can guarantee you they're not satisfied. So I gave this example. I said, you guys have a giant Buddha in the middle of every little village. But as Americans, we have a giant TV in every single one of our houses. <laughs> and pray God, there is nothing wrong with TV. I enjoy myself an office episode every once in a while. <laughs> but... Um, that is not where I'm going to find who I really am. I was in Sri Lanka again. I was at a ca coffee shop, and it was an amazing, amazing experience. There was a lady on the same team as me who shared her testimony as, um, in front of all of these ladies that came into the room. And um, he, it was all single ladies that were working at this coffee shop. They were growing beans and whatnot. And they all came in, and um, this lady on my team shared this, her testimony about how she had been saved from so much. She had been abused as a child. She had been, her um, husband had cheated on her, and she had a crisis of identity. And um, in the coffee shop, there was all these girls crying. There was tears. I mean, there wasn't even a dry eye in there. I was crying. It hit me so much. The Spirit of God fell and impacted these ladies, and it was amazing. After that, after that, um, that, that message that we got to share with them, there was a lot of, um, of girls coming home to the Father, and it was amazing. But there's this one girl in the back of the class, of the coffee shop, I should say. There's this one girl in the back of the coffee shop. She had blue eyes, so she didn't look like the Sri Lankan ladies over there, and I was kind of like, I don't know what's going on. What, let me go talk to her and see if she's okay. She was kind of hidden in the back. She was wearing a hoodie, so she was kind of covered and whatnot. And um, I went up to her, and I said, hey, do you, do, you, do you want me to pray for you? Is there anything I can help you with? And she said no. She didn't even really say anything. She just nodded her head. She said nope. And so I said, no problem at all. If you need me, just come get me. I'll pray for you. Um, I want to be a blessing. And um, she, she didn't say anything. She just looked down. So I, was, I said, okay. I went on to the next girl. I prayed for this lady's leg. And her leg got better. And praise God. And it was a lot better. Amen. But amen. God can do amazing things, and he's still moving today. Amen. Still moving today. So this lady, she had blue eyes. She didn't look like the rest of the Sri Lankan ladies. So I was kind of curious, you know, what, what is she doing here? Who is this, you know? And she was very put off. She just wanted to see. She didn't really want to interact. And um, so, I, so I prayed for this lady's leg, and she got healed right in front of this lady. And I walked off, and I went on and ministered to other ladies and whatnot. And um, then all of a sudden, another member of my team, her name was Jackie, she brought this lady up with the blue eyes to me, and she said, Chris, you won't believe it, she speaks French. So, <laughs> I seized the opportunity. This lady was from France, all the way, I don't know, 6,000 miles away, something crazy. I mean, it was far away. But she was in a little village in a coffee shop at the same time as me. I was like, praise God, this has got to be a divine appointment, right? So, I talked to her a little bit. She started to open up. And she, she told me something that blew me away. She said, I'm 26. I'm traveling the world. I'm looking for who I am because this world is not satisfying me. She told me that at 26. She is looking for something bigger than herself. And I had the opportunity. <laughs> Amen. She was in a coffee shop the same day as me, as I was the only person that spoke French, and she, was the only, she only spoke French. She could barely speak English. And I had the opportunity to look her straight in the eyes and said, she asked me, this, she asked me another question, which was interesting. She, she asked me, what is the difference between Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, all of these other religions? And I said, religion is simply man trying to work their way to God, Right? Man is trying to work their way to God through rituals, through their prayers, through their yearning, through whatever that may look like, their, their, their uh, fasts. And I told her the difference between every other religion out there, I don't, you name it, 
is not that we are working our way to God, but God worked his way to man. Right? Amen. Jesus worked his way to man. Haha. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's not sitting up on his throne in the in heaven saying, Oh, these humans. He's saying, Oh, my children. Oh, if only they knew their identity. I have an idea. I can send my son Jesus to give them an example of everything you're supposed to do and everything they're supposed to look like, not in condemnation, but in love. So he sent his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever shall believe upon him shall receive eternal life. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, one thing that I always tell God is that I never, ever want your presence to leave me. Not even for a second. I was in South Carolina, and I love my parents so dearly. And I told God before I moved to Colorado, I want, I don't want to feel homesick. I don't want to feel like I'm missing because I have amazing friends right here that I'm so thankful they came. I love them so much, and I did not want to feel homesick. I didn't. And I said, God, if you come with me to Colorado, then I'll go, you know? Kind of like Moses said, right? You guys remember that story where Moses said, if your presence follows me, I'll go. But if not, I'm not going, right? That's the boldness we got to have. And that was Old Covenant, and now we're New Covenant, and praise God, it's a lot better. But his presence never will leave you. It says in the scriptures that I will never leave you nor forsake you, not even for a second, not even if you mess up, not even if you look away. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So I moved to Colorado, and his presence always, always was there, every moment, every moment, even when I was not doing so good, and even when I messed up. His presence, his presence was there with me, and it was amazing. God told me, you know why you never felt homesick? You never felt like you're missing South Carolina? He said, because where my presence is, is where home is. Amen? So I'm telling you guys, amen? Amen. So I, it sounds kind of crazy, but if you guys go to Africa or wherever God may send you, you're going to be at home because God's there with you, right? Amen. I just felt like I needed to encourage you guys on that. So um, anyways, so we're looking at the life of Jesus and we're looking at him not condemning us, but we're looking at how he, by his love, is transforming us. So what did Jesus do in those 30 years before he started ministry? Yeah. He was growing in his relationship with God. He was growing in the scriptures. You know, at the age of 12, he was in the, he was in the um, temples learning and speaking at the age of 12. That's crazy. Because he was getting to know who he was. He was getting to know who the Father was in those 30 years. So I've been given three special years in my life. I have one more year in Colorado. But I've been given three special years to know the Father. And I've been fully devoted to that. And um, that's really what I want to, that's where I want to grow, is in my relationship with God and know the Father so that I can step into ministry. Um, I, um, I felt last night as I was praying for the service, what, what is it, God, you want to share? Because I, I had... Um, I had a lot on my heart. I mean, after two years of Bible school, we do four hours a day. We do um, four hours a day, five days a week for a whole school year. That's a lot of scriptures. <laughs> that's a lot of testimonies. That's a lot of life change, and that's a lot of heart change. And I didn't know where to start, and I said, God, where do you want to go with this? And God wanted to show me, or show you guys, I believe, that emotions are fickle. Emotions are fickle. They're here today, gone tomorrow. Um, it's a bold statement, but it's true. Like I shared before, Paul and Silas, they weren't focused on what they were feeling temporarily, but they were focused on the eternal, and that therefore changed their heart, and they were able to sing and dance and praise God. And so God told me that, he gave me an example. He showed me that when Jesus walked into the temple where they were selling things and they were marketing things and they were just abusing the temple, God said, this is my temple. What are you guys doing here? You guys are destroying what my God is called sacred. And he pushed them out of there. And he showed me that a lot of times our emotions look like those stands, look like those things that are up for bid. 
Your emotions are up for bid. You know, the, uh, the enemy is selling your, your happiness. The enemy is trying to sell your joy. And Jesus is coming in to your temple, which is the, your body. He calls our body his holy temple. He's coming into your temple. He's saying, what are you doing? This is sacred. This is sacred. Your emotions are not dictated, and they're not up for grab from the enemy, first place. So God wanted to show, share with you guys that the only true hope that we have and the only true joy that we have is in Jesus. Amen? And I'm not saying that because we're in a church, but it's the truth. I mean, I see it countless times in scriptures, and I saw it countless times in my life too, that when even things were hard, God was there. God was there, and he, his joy was there too. There was one day, an amazing story. I was, one day I came out to go to school, and I, have a, I have a, got out of my apartment, and I got into my car, and I was going to go to school that day. It was early in the morning. And before I left for school, I saw on the coffee table a little, um, a little notice from my bank. Excuse me. It said, your account has been um, like running low. It's running low. You need to check your funds or whatever that may look like. And I got frustrated. I said, God, I'm out here for you, and yet it feels like I'm fighting for myself out here, you know? And I got frustrated, and I got in my car, and I was going to, and I was going to go to school. And all of a sudden, I promise you, this bird, this black bird, this crow, swooped down out of nowhere and dropped a piece of bread right next to my feet. It was incredible. You guys remember the story of Elijah? Yeah. Amen. His place called there. <laughs> It was incredible. I didn't even know about the story, even though I was a second-year Bible student. I didn't even know about the story. And I walked in, I said to my, my roommate, Adrian, I said, Adrian, you wouldn't even believe what happened. A huge bird just dropped a piece of bread next to my feet. And he's, and he's like, whoa, like Elijah. I was like, who's, who's Elijah? <laughs> so I looked it up in the scripture, and God showed me something powerful, man. When we go where he is calling, he provides without fail. Without fail, God provides. Amen? So I want to ask you guys, where is God calling you? And it might look simple. It might not look like Bible school. It might not look like, um, it might not look like Bible school. It might not look like going into becoming a minister or a full-time missionary. But where is God calling you today? Because it's not based off emotions, because like I told you, they're fickle. And it's not based off of um, what we might think um, it should look like, because we look at the life of Jesus, and he demonstrated what it really looks like, his ministry. And um, so I want to tell you guys that it's, that, um, or I want to ask you guys, where, where is God calling you today? Um, like I told you, if you go, God provides. I promise, and I've seen it countless times in my life. Countless times in my life. I can't explain it. It was, in, and not just through finances, but, and then believe it or not, I didn't finish that story, but there was a piece of bread that came, that was next to my feet, right? I picked it up, and then, and I went to go grocery shopping the next, the, that night. I came back, and believe it or not, there was on the counter, as I got back, and I was dropping my groceries off, the, ex almost to the dot, and I promise you, almost to the dot, a check from my past employer that I hadn't worked for for two years to the dot, the amount of money needed for groceries. Amen? Incredible. But see, and I want to tell you guys, God's not just a God of sufficiency. He's a God of abundance. Amen? He, through that, didn't just provide for my groceries on the dot, but he provided for school for the next year, which is a blessing to me. He provided so many opportunities. He provided this opportunity to come speak to you guys. I count this as a huge blessing. He's provided countless times, and he's not just a God of sufficiency. He's a God of abundance. Amen? Where is God sending you? Where is God sending you? Be faithful in that. Be diligent in that. Amen. Awesome. So I'm going to be closing up here soon, but I really wanted to just thank you guys for that, um, this opportunity once again. And um, Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the life of Jesus. Um, in 1 Corinthians 13, Four through seven. First Corinthians four, or sorry, First Corinthians thirteen four through seven. Thirteen four through seven. We read that this morning, which I thought was amazing. It says charity 
a.k.a. love. So love suthereth, su- suffereth long. Can we have a new King James Version, Frank? <laughs> if that's possible. No? Okay. That's okay. <laughs> so love endures. Or there we go. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Verse 5, please or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. One more. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Amen. So what is, who is love? Who was represented in love? Jesus, right? It says in the scriptures that no greater love was for a man to die for his friends. There is no greater love for someone to lay his life down for someone else. Jesus did it. So God is the ultimate representation of love, right? He asks us to become love because he knows it's possible. Do you think, do you think as Jesus was hanging on the cross 2,000 years ago, do you think he was saying, Man, look at these people. They're never going to be able to repay for what I did. Look at them. No, he was counting no records of wrong. He wasn't even jealous. He wasn't even envious. He just says, I love them because that is the true representation of love, right? And it also says in the scriptures that perfect love casts out all fear. I'm going to be ending on this and then I'm going to go close in prayer if that's okay, Bob. Um, love casts out, perfect love casts out all fear. What does fear look like in your life? What is hindering you from stepping into the ministry that God's calling you? Because I promise you, Jesus has already paid it. It says, perfect love casts out all fear. As Jesus is casting out those, vic- those uh, vicious emotions in your life, as Jesus is casting out all of those vile emotions or whatever that may look like, Jesus is also casting out poverty. He's casting out sickness. He's casting out a lack of identity because we know who we are now in Christ. He is casting out um, the inability to pursue ministry. He's casting out the, the fear of not able to see a manifestation in our life because he's the manifestation in our lives. We, he has conquered fear. He has cast out all fear, all fear. And I'm telling you guys today, as a 20-year-old, if you could send you any advice, it would be to trust God and grow in God because he never lets us down, not even for a second. He casts out all fear. Every fear that was, every fear that is, and every fear that's going to be, Jesus has cast it out with his perfect, perfect love. I'm going to close in prayer, and I want to thank you guys so much for this opportunity again. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your words. Thank you, Father God, for your grace. Thank you, Lord God, for being with me, for being with us and building something up in our hearts and transforming our lives and and pursuing us constantly. You never let us go. You never let us down, not for a second. And I am... And if I am a witness, Lord God, I will proclaim your name and I will say you are great. And I pray that God today, that my brothers and sisters will proclaim your name as well and say that you are great and show all of the world that is eagerly yearning for you. Eager, eagerly yearning for all of us to be manifested into your image, God. Thank you again, Father, for this opportunity. I just lift your name high and I just thank you again for your love and your grace and your peace. In Jesus' name. Amen.